sector. Okay, so a pleasant good afternoon to everyone. And today's lab class, we'll be looking at the urinary system and urinalysis. Now, this is very important. Why is it important that we examine the urinary system? Hmm, what do you think? Because the urinary system is critical for in what regard? Anybody wants to throw in a, a response to that? Why is it so important? So for the kidneys. For the kidneys, right? So kidneys, very, very true. That's a major organ associated with the urinary system. And when we think of another structure associated with the urinary system, we have kidneys and we also have the bladder. When we think about bladder, what type of tissue is usually present? You know, it should come like hand in glove. Like, you know, when you say left, what's the next word that comes to mind? If I say left, what's the next word that comes to mind? Right. Good. Right. If I say black, what's the next word that comes to mind? Right. If I say right. up, what's the next word that comes to mind? Down. Down. So if I say bladder, what type of cell comes to mind? TP. No, well, T E. Tran. Trans. Positional. What? It don't make sense. I teach, you know everything. So whenever you hear bladder, just like up, down, left, right, transitional epithelium bladder. Right, that's the first thing that should come to mind. And we'll see more of it as we go along in the lecture. So in terms of the urinary system, and what does it do primarily? Sub, well, it's subdivided into two major now, functional divisions. We have the kidney, which actually manufactures the urine, and then we have the excretory passages, namely the ureters, bladder, and urethra. And they go in that order, the urethra, the ureters, sorry, they empty the kidneys and the, it goes to the bladder, bladder fills up and it is voided to the external environment via the urethra. So here we see diagrammatically the structures which we just looked at. Kidneys, why do we have two kidneys? One word beginning with B. It, it don't make sense, I teach, you all know everything. Back up, very good. Could we live with one kidney? Yes. yes. Yes, the answer is yes. And could you justify that by giving me a real world example? We could live with one kidney. Give me a, give me a, we could live, for so example. Because mm -hmm. there is no kidney transplant. Thank you very much. Yeah. So if you couldn't do, I mean, I mean uh, from a live donor, kidney transplants are done, right? So if it, if it wasn't so, you know, in terms of that, it wouldn't have been possible just to have it. So we do have two kidneys, one really out of backup. So in terms of structurally, in terms of capacity, these things are not running at 100% and, you know, they're less than that. So most definitely in terms of the output, when you do remove one, let's say you are the um, donor and you remove one kidney, well, the capacity in terms of the filtration and electrolyte balance, homeostatic mechanisms associated with the kidneys, this will actually go up with the other one. But yes, you could have just uh, one kidney. I think I mentioned it for you, the head of the Catholic Church, Pope Francis, when he was younger, he had um, a diseased kidney. It, it, he was wrought by infection and antibiotics was not a big thing then. This was in his teenage years. So he had, had to have it um, removed when I was con So kidneys, when we look at these structures on top of the kidneys, what are they? Adrenal glands. They're right, these are the adrenal glands. And what do they secrete? Do they lead to the secretion of? Something that increases heart rate, makes us flush in the face. And it, it actually sounds like adrenal. In terms adrenaline. Adrenaline, adrenaline, yeah. What's another name for adrenaline? So adrenaline is used by the Americans. So, um, if you were to, sorry, by the British, if you were to go in America, what do they call adrenaline? It has another name. Ep, epi, 
Me. So that epinephrine? Epinephrine, yeah. So epinephrine and adrenaline is one, one and the same. So for instance, you know, when persons have anaphylactic shocks, right? In terms of going through where they do have swellings or if they have an allergy to bee stings and so on, what do they have to inject into their thigh? Was that um, device known as? Is that something like a pen? An well, EpiPen. An EpiPen. And the reason why they call it an EpiPen, the Epi is really epinephrine. So what they're actually inserting into their thigh, injecting into that large muscle there for distribution through the body, eventually it would get to the lung, causing vasodilation and the relief of that, not only the lungs, but the trachea, and also relief of that um, constriction, which, it, which usually accompanies uh, anaphylactic attack. So that's why they call it EpiPen. It's epinephrine that you're really injecting. Left and right kidney, here are the ureters, voids, and it goes into the bladder. There are nerves that tells the brain that the bladder is full. And I think we can identify with that, yes? Don't we know when it's time to void our bladder? Yeah, usually we do when it's full. And actually a nice trick, if you have to get up like four o'clock in the morning, yes, you set your clock. Anybody knows another way, what you could do to actually make sure you get up at four in the morning? What you could do in the night? There's a little trick you could do. Drink water. Thank you very much, yeah. So if a way you really must get up in the morning, you should give it a try. Drink a lot of water before you go to bed, yeah? Believe you me, that alarm clock will go off at four. It will definitely get you up at around four or even earlier in terms of emptying your bladder, all right? So kidneys, ureters, bladder, and I forgot, what type of epithelium is associated with this? With the bladder, what type of epithelia? T. Transitional, right? Very good. And then from the bladder, it's voided to the external environment via the urethra. Here it is, we have a... Um, we have both internal and external sphincter muscles that regulate the emptying of the bladder. Which one do we have control over, the internal or the external? You have a 50-50 chance of getting it right. Which one would you say? Transitional. Thanks, Shaloma. So for this one, in terms of control of the emptying of the bladder, internal or external, which one do we have control over in terms of voluntary control? External. Hi, Thank you. Thank well you. done. Yeah. External. It was a 50-50 and external. You're quite right. So external, it's voluntary, but the internal one is involuntary control. All right. So that was a that was a good guess. Oh, you probably knew it all along. The kidneys, paired organs. And in terms of the parts, these are the parts associated with them. It's best to look at it diagrammatically. It makes a little more sense. So here we have the cortex, and I see how I remember the cortex region, because it looks like the letter, what letter it looks like? C, yeah? You don't find so? Yes, sir. All right. Okay, just give me one second. I'll just have to, just give me one minute. Okay, so this is the kidney we're looking at. Is this the left or the right kidney we're looking at, by the way? Oh, that's a hard call. I want to say it's right. Not the right kidney. How do we know it's the right kidney? <laughs> I said if I did bottom there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Always use your eyes. All right, that's always important. This is your right kidney. So the cortex, note the shape very much like you let us see. Then you have the calyx, C, singular is calyx. You have the minor, which is the smaller one. And then you have the major calyx, which is the larger of the two. These empty, of course, into the pelvis region. And the pelvis, so all of the um, drainings from these regions, i.e. the urine, right, they come down through the ureter. Let's see how that looks in real. So it's good to look diagrammatically. Let's look at some fresh kidneys. So this is a kidney in section. Uh, from a live, I don't know if it's a live specimen or a cadaver or recently deceased person, but this is how it looks like. And again, we see the structures, the cortex, 
right? Very important, the medulla, which is the middle area, the calyx, and then of course, you have the ureter, which is opened. So normally these would drain into this, the ureter, and then collectively the ureters, they go down to the bladder itself. So why is the right kidney slightly inferior to the left kidney? If you were to ask that, why would you say that? Why is the right one? So in other words, the right kidney is lower down than the left kidney. So what, why is that so? What, what, would you, why, what would you say? And it's due to a very large organ that comes right here. A very large organ that is actually the largest organ. It's larger than the brain itself. It's a very large organ that comes across your whole body. It's big. And it rhymes with shiver. Liver. Thank you very much. Liver. Well done. Yeah. So the liver. So do remember that. This is the reason to accommodate the liver. The right kidney is actually inferior to the left kidney. So the nephron functional unit of the structural and functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. If it's one take home, a very important one, liver, thanks Shaloma. One important take home message for, from this lecture is to remember the functional and structural unit of the kidneys is the nephron. And in terms of the nephron, it consists of these structures, the glomerulus, the tubule, the Bowman's capsule. Why do you think it was called Bowman's capsule? Anybody wants to guess? Why do they call it Bowman's capsule? For a very simple reason. It was named we, after Sir. Thank you. And that person was Bowman. Yeah. So for instance, if you spend a lot of time in the lab doing all your work and you finally figure it out, would you name it after yourself? You'll call it the, the cavita tubule or the aquila tubule, you know, or something of that nature. Not so? Yeah, you'd call it as how you see it, the Shaloma loop, right? Just like this one, the loop of Henley. Yeah, the guy name was Henley. So you'll call it the loop, loop of Shaloma, you know, because you spend all the time doing your research. So therefore you throw that in there, right? <laughs> okay, so the nephron, these structures, loop of Henley, so-called because it's a loop proximally located to the nephron, and it extends either a short way away or a long way into the medulla. It contains these structures, and we look at them in a little more detail as we go along. So do remember, in terms of the take-home, structural and functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. What type of tissue is associated with the bladder again? What type of epithelium begins with T? Transitional. It's very much like, you know, the type of lenses, you know, when you see those ads, those, those um, lenses that change color when it's exposed to sunlight, they call them transitional, right? So in a very, so how could we link that, you know, glasses, lenses to bladder? Could, could you see a link so that, you know, we could associate the two? transitional lenses and to the tissue in the bladder. Anybody could see a link? Is it like adjustment, like they adjust? Adjust, yeah, that's one way because they both adjust, right? So in terms of having the capacity to cause the bladder to expand, that's what transit, yeah, that's what those, um, that's what they do, the transitional epithelia. They have within them that capacity to expand. So very much like how the, the lenses change color to protect your eyes, the retina in particular, which is light sensitive. In a similar manner, the bladder has an ability to expand. A nice way to remember it, so just remember the glasses. So another way, if you're a visual learner, when you're drawing the bladder, you know, and you're looking at the kidneys, if you could go back, does it look like eyes by chance? Does it? That's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> That's, you know, you could like draw a glasses around. You could draw a glasses around it. So, well, or down here, what you could do is, that'll probably be best next thing you say, the liver, I mean, the kidney is made out of transitional. You could draw glasses around it and um, put one dark and leave one blank 
So you know then it's changing. So the type of tissue is transitional. Not so? So that is just one way, you know, to remember it, whichever way works for you, that's fine. So when we're looking here in this diagram, we could see those structures which we spoke about, the Bowman's capsule, and this is it here. And here we have the glomerulus. The glomer so how does the kidney work? The kidney works overall. Two words, PF. What does the P stand for? It doesn't have to do with urine. The P, a word, P. And let me give you a hint. Yeah, once other thing to do on a short space of time. So you say you're under pressure. pressure. So the P is pressure. And what does the F stand for? What, what does the kidneys do? What do they do as it relates to impurities in the blood? Well they, it doesn't make sense. I teach you all know everything. Well done. So PF, in a nutshell, what the kidney does is pressure filtration. And that is why, for instance, you have this, this Bowman's capsule here filled with this glomerulus. So what happens, this is the afferent arteriole. So this is an artery here. And the artery division, it gets smaller. And so that's why it's called an arteriole. And these arterioles, they're convoluted. Why do you think they're twisted up like this? This has to do with what? Is either a word that begins with either V or E. You could change it up, depends on how you look at it. S A or V. S -A. A larger S A, or you could say a larger V in a very small area. A larger V of blood to be held. You said it, volume, well done. Volume, yeah. So yeah, so the volume of blood, so think about it, it's convoluted. So that you, if think about, if this was just a straight, you know, piece coming here, you'd have X amount of blood in here. But because of the fact is, you know, it twists and turn, you have a whole lot of blood coming in, right? And that is why it's convoluted. Number one, to have a lot of blood and also to increase the pressure. Because remember, how this works is by pressure filtration. You build up the pressure, and because of that, you have these small slits located along this region. And literally, the blood or the red blood cells, they don't drain into this region, but they pass through and they leave via the afferent arterial. And they, they do pass all the way down here, but they do get back into the general circulation thereafter. But all the waste is filtered out into, and it passes through here. This is the distant, uh, no, the proximal tubule. This is the distant, ultimately coming to the collecting duct. From the collecting duct, they form the ureters down to the bladder, down to the urethra. So do remember that when you're thinking about the kidneys, pressure filtration, you have to have a certain amount of pressure before it actually filters out. So it comes like when you're making sorrel, Christmas coming just now, yes? When you're making sorrel and you put the sorrel in the strainer, what do you have to do to get the last set of sorrel? What do you have to do? Squeeze it. You have to squeeze it. So in other words, you are applying pressure. And it's the same thing here. So the blood is coming through. To get those waste out, you have to have a pressure. And the pressure builds up because of the fact of all of these. You know, it, it, twists, it twists it up. It twists up. You, know, you go in and out, in and out, wrong and wrong. So it builds up a pressure. And that pressure helps to filter the blood and get the waste out. Is it normal to have blood in your urine? So you know if you're urine, yes, you see blood. Yes, no, that it could no. point to something um, wrong. Could you think of something, however, that could color your blood red? Something that you could eat. And it rhymes with feet. Beetroot. Yes, beetroot. I don't know if it have happened with anybody. With certain people, it does. I know for me. It happens periodically, you know? But um, some certain times when I do eat um, beets, and you know, you go to the bathroom, you see it coming out, your urine come out red. And you know, so sometimes, you know, in your professional career, do keep that in mind. If somebody presents and they're talking about blood in the urine thing, you know, discreetly, you could ask them if they had beets by any chance for any meal. 
you know, so sometimes you could get false positive that way. You know, yes, they're thinking that, oh, yes, it's blood, oh, Lord, nearer my God to thee. I come in I'm death's waiting room. No, that's not true. Could be because you consume some beets, and that's the reason why that is happening. Okay? All right, let's go forward. So here yeah, it is it's showing then the blood from the afferent arteriole. So it's coming in. This is the artery. And it flows through this glomerulus, which is a, a tortuous winding of the blood vessels. It's, it's wind up here. And then it's, it flows through. And here it is. You have the proximal convoluted tubule filtration occurring. And then you are having the collection of the waste products. In terms of what is usually excreted, you have electrolytes. What is an electrolyte? You know, sometimes we use these big, the, a number of words in biology or in science for that matter. Let me speak about electrolyte. What do we speak about? What is an electrolyte? CC. And one of the, the last C is a carrier. So what do electrolytes do? They carry what? Something that begins with C. And I'll give you another hint, plus or minus. Those are called. What's happened when a police officer, if you're speeding and they catch you, they give you a what? Not a ticket, <laughs> but a, if your battery low, what does that to do with it? A charge, very good, right? So all electrolytes are, they're charge carriers. And why is it important that we have electrolytes in the body? What organ system is highly dependent, notwithstanding the kidneys, because depending on the charge, you could now the charges which accumulates around this region, you could then vary the amount of water and salts that go through to the external environment. But what organ system is highly responsive to charges, changes in charges? You know, his dilemma them is uh, choose one. It begins with N. Thank you, nervous system. Yeah, the nervous system, very, very, um, important, and you looked at that way in SNF1 in terms of the nervous system and how charges are very important. All right, so not only is it important there, it's important here as well, because depending on the concentration, you're building up concentration gradients outside based on the, the different electrolytes which accumulate on the outside. And in doing so, you could vary how the electrolytes which are in the waste actually move in or retained or they are uh, left within the uh, convoluted tubules to be excreted in the collecting duct. When we're looking at this collecting duct, this region over here, there's a hormone that actually affects its porosity or its porousness. What is that hormone? I'll give you, let's see if we could talk it through. When we speak about the ability um, to urinate or to pass water, there's a particular class of drugs that cause you to urinate or to pass water or to micturate. So micturation refers to urinate, urinating. What is that class of drugs known as? It begins with D and it rhymes with? Diuretics. Okay. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense I teach. Well done, diuretics. So diuretics, they cause you to urinate. So what would an antidiuretic do then? If you take a tablet that's an antidiuretic, what would it do? Stop you from peeing. Yeah, stop you from urinating, stop you from peeing, stop you from stopping the micturition process, right? So therefore, there's a hormone ADH that is secreted. So therefore, when ADH is secreted, what, what happens to the volume of urine that you usually pass out? Would it increase or decrease in the presence of ADH? The volume of the urine that you expel, would it increase or decrease when ADH is secreted in your body? Increase, All right. So a diuretic causes you to urinate. An antidiuretic would stop the urination process. So therefore, if ADH is secreted in your body, right, and at the level of the collecting duct, which is what it does, right, it opens up channels such that water could be reabsorbed. So how does that affect the volume of your urine? Do you urinate? Um, more or would you urinate less?
in the presence of ADH in your body, antidiuretic. So a diuretic makes you urinate. Antidiuretic, what it does? Stop urination. Stop urination, right. So in the presence of ADH, you actually urinate less. So let me ask you this other question. When you think about um, decreases, right? Where are you get chiloma? When you're thinking about diabetics, what is one of the things associated with diabetes, particularly type two, as it relates to urination? Frequent urination. Frequent, Frequent urination. urination. So how does that relate to ADH then? So when you're thinking about it do, with diabetes, um, do you, is it more ADH is secreted or less ADH is secreted by the body than normal? Less is secreted. Oh, very good. Yeah. So less. So when you think about it from that in that um, from that perspective, less ADH is actually secreted. So the ability to the volume of urine that is secreted is decreased. All right. So do remember that. So with diabetics, all right, less ADH, or they're secreting is something that they, that is being released that is actually causing the breakdown of ADH. But most definitely, the ADH is not reaching to this region to increase the porosity of this. Right, so when this, in, if we increase the porosity or the amount of pores in the collecting duct, what happens is um, the urine becomes more concentrated because more water is actually absorbed in this area. Yes? All right, well done. So let's talk now about the blood flow through the kidney itself. And then, so it's better to look at it diagrammatically. Anybody, in terms of your learning styles, everybody know their learning styles by chance? If it, in terms of if you're a visual learner, auditory learner, or you you know, uh, everybody familiar with it? Mm -hmm. I still try to figure out mine. You know, there's a test you could take, or like an online. It's it's online. And of course it has a number one word attached to it, which I like, which is free. Um, type of learner. And it could actually, you know, they ask. And that is important because type of learner. Uh, visual. They give you that test in the beginning. I was not going to say the same thing. The custard gives you it. I think it's Ivaka. I think. I don't yeah. Know. Um, learning styles, either ordinary, sorry, auditory, visual, tactile, which means like the to touch, which is why some people like books. You know, they, that sensation of touching the page, turning the page. Yeah, that actually helps them remember. Right? So, type of visual learner online test uh, I, will, I will post it in the um in the, uh, the whatsapp in the whatsapp um, group the vac test you're quite right somebody just mentioned it right so the visual auditory and kinesthetic kinesthetic with place to touch so you're quite right all right so it's good to have a look at it i know for me i'm a visual learner so like for instance if i'm learning the kidney this has more meaning than actually this but for some persons, well, you know, they do like it like this. But for me, reinforcement by seeing an image, it really does help for me. So, so that's, that's how, I, how, how I view it. Let's have a look and see how the blood flows now through the kidney itself. So it flows first to the renal artery, then to the segmental artery, this region here. From the segmental, it goes into these are lobules, so the interlobular artery. From the interlobular, it goes to the arcuate, from the arcuate to these different ones, until ultimately it comes to a, what is the functional unit of the kidney causal again? I forgot. The functional and structural unit of the kidney. The nephron? Yeah, say it loud and say it proud. I don't know if I ever mentioned it here, but if ever I laugh at you, I'll give you a, um, a voucher for two hundred dollars, so you could go have lunch, you know, at at a place of your choosing, because it's wrong of me, you know, Tyler. Uh, bring you down if you ever you say. Have I told you all that story? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. there you go. So therefore, don't be nervous. Say what is on your mind, and as I mentioned as well, sometimes the most brilliant of responses come, you know, from um, from utterances like that, and. Whenever you do get time, you, you should go to the Nobel Prize website. The Nobel Prize website, of course, the Nobel Prize in the different fields of endeavor, of medicine, um, anatomy and physiology, physics, um, well, the Peace Prize, economics. So these are persons in the top field. When you look historically at it, 
you know, one, you'd find out that most of these people weren't all that, you know, they weren't naturally brilliant or anything like that. But yes, they did. They had more. The major thing they had going for them is stick to itiveness. In other words, then yes, I have something to do and I will do it regardless of, of what, you know, the, the surrounding circumstances. So having stick to itiveness most definitely helps. So always do remember that. Just stick to the cause and ultimately it does pay dividends. All right. But when you have chance, you must look at some of those stories. It's, very, it's rather fascinating when you read a lot of those stories of these great men and women in, the, in these different fields. Let's go. Structural and functional unit, nephron. So in terms of coming through all of this way, in terms of the blood, then it goes through the nephron and it blood is actually filtered. What is it the next? There's another organ that actually is associated with filtration or cleaning of the blood, particularly the blood that um, after a meal, you would have looked at this in SNF1 and digestion, after digestion, the blood goes through a very big organ in the body. What organ is that one? before it is returned to the heart and to the systemic circulation. Which organ is that? So, so, the, so the blood surrounds, you know, in particular, the small intestine, and it reabsorbs the nutrient, it absorbs the nutrients there. So this nutrient-rich blood then, it has to go through a filtration process. So it goes through, not the kidneys, but what structure does it go through? A very big organ, biggest organ in the body. The liver, well done. Yeah, right? So it goes through the liver and then from the liver, the liver does some different detoxification, deamination, different processes. And then from the liver, it goes to the, it, via the envira vena cava to the heart and then goes back into the systemic circulation, right? So that is important to remember. And I think some persons will appreciate that, um, not only from the liver, but also from the stomach as well, right? When you drink alcohol, right? It has to detoxify, detoxification occurs in the liver itself, very importantly. So after going through all of these different structures, then it enters the nephrons, right? The nephrons, those functional units, and the functional units, then number one, they regulate the salts which are returned to the body in terms of those electrolytes or the charge carriers. So name me an element that actually carries a positive charge, the main one from sodium chloride, right? Which one carries the positive charge? Any plus? So is that any sodium ion or the chloride ion? Which one do you think carries a positive charge? The sodium. Correct is right. And by elimination, the chloride carries the negative. So whenever you hear, you know, oftentimes we always say about electrolytes, electrolytes, electrolyte balance, ting ling ling, you know, gator aid, electrolytes. All they're talking about is something that carries a charge. So therefore, the simplest thing which you could use to um, as an electrolyte is salt and water. Yeah, that's an electrolyte. Because when you, when you do consume it, you're consuming sodium ions. In water, salt dissociates into its ions. So you get the sodium ion, Na+, plus, and you also get the chloride ion, Cl-, minus, right? And, now, and in fact, if you were to think about it that way as well, Gatorade is nothing more than glorified salt water. It really is, right? So they, at the bottom, at the lowest level, they take salt water and then they add the coloring, they add the fancy bottle, right? They add flavoring and things. But the bottom line, it's just salt water. That's all it is, salt water. Okay. So here it is, we have it, functional unit. And this is where we have the filtration, reabsorption of water happening. So the ureters, structurally, these drain into the calices and they in turn empty into the renal pelvis, as we mentioned. The ureters are the tubes that transport urine from the kidneys to the bladder. So if we were to look here, what, we, what structure are we looking at here, by the way? If I, took, if I were to tell you these are the ureters, what structure we're looking at here? This whole thing would be the? Bladder. The bladder, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I like how you're thinking glomerulus. It does look indeed very much like a glomerular. I like how you're thinking. Look at this. 
right? So this is the convoluted areas associated with the uh, nephron, and this is indeed the glomerulus. The only reason why, and I like how you're thinking, they should have given us a little, um, uh, what do you call it, a key to tell us how much the size of this, right, the, the actual size of, of this, and then we don't recognize it as a bladder. But you're quite right, I like how you're thinking, this does indeed, and this is in fact exactly how the glomerulus looks, I like how you're thinking. All right, so this is a bladder. What gender is it? Is it male or female? I'll give you a hint. This mm -hmm. purple thing here is the prostate. So if I were to tell you that, I know, I rephrase the question, is it male or female? Male, male. Male, yeah. So this, yeah, the structure here is the prostate. And of course, could this pro if this prostate swells, what do you think will happen to the flow of urine? It flows or it stops? Yeah, yeah. And my understanding that is the closest thing to childbirth that males will ever go through. You, you just imagine this, because this is like a donut. So this is just a section, but think about a donut with the hole and the urethra runs through that hole. So when this, this um, prostate swells, it squeezes down and onto the point where imagine urine is not flowing through. So this stays in there. So imagine your bladder is filling, you're getting, you know, the signals, you know, from the stretch receptors that yes, your uh, bladder is full, but you, you don't have the ability to empty it. So as I said, my understanding, it is exceptionally painful. So what do they do? What do they do to alleviate the pain? They can do one of two things. Oh, and so far, catheter. Catheter up the penis itself via the urethra. Now, they do use localized anesthesia, and of course, they lubricate the catheter with um, KY jelly, most definitely, right, to get it up the urethra, so that opens it. But what's another thing they could do? If it is, let's say, particularly for older patients, where you run the risk of the, um, you, the urethra is very sensitive, and even the running of the uh, catheter causes issues, what else could they do? Well, they could make an incision directly into the bladder itself. Yeah, they can make an incision, run a catheter there to drain it. So it's one out of two options, but they always try, of course, an non-invasive one first, going through the penis itself via the urethra. Rugae, this helps the stretch the bladder to actually stretch out. And as we mentioned, what, what type of, um, what type of, Epithelia is located here. Think about the glasses. What type of epithelium? Transitional. Transitional, transitional. Well done. Let's go. Right? Urethra and urethra. The urethra, it voids the uh, bladder to the external environments. The urethra brings urine from the kidneys to the bladder itself. How could we, um, how could we remember those two and not mix them up? Anybody? I'll give you a, I'll give you a minute. Think about it. Let's see if you could come up with the best one, the best idea how we could remember it, okay? Okay, time up. Anybody has a way to remember the two? We could tell the difference between the two. Ureta and urethra. How do we know ureta is the one that comes from the kidneys and urethra is one that comes from the bladder? Anybody could think of a way? Because it's very easy to mix up. They both sound similar. Could you think of a way to remember it? Like to the external, that is what I think. Yeah. So could you think of a way, no, you know, you might say, um, yes, yeah, it's easy to remember. And I, some people have their memories set up like it. I applaud you. 
But you know, I always remember when I used to play football, what the coach used to say, what does pressure do to pipe? What does pressure is do? Bus pipe. Pressure is bus pipe, yes. yes. <laughs> Burst pipe would be the correct English pronunciation in the vernacular of Trinidad and Tobago. You know, we just say bus pipe, pressure is bus pipe. Sometimes when you're under pressure, yes, yes, suddenly you now you're looking at it too. Which one it is? Which one is Eureka? Which one is Eureka? Ah, can't remember. Ah. Could you think of a way, a foolproof method, you could, you know, so you could link Eureka to the bladder and you to the MTN. Anybody could think of a way? You know, with association then or, or something to help you remember. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I would say the ureta, uterus, like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the utra is more the one for the external use. I hear you. In fact, the thra sound like throw. Yeah. So you're coming like you're pelting the urine outside. Yeah. So that's what I like how you're thinking. So the throw is like throw. You retry, you're throwing. You're throwing the urine outside. So when you think of your throw, you're, you're thinking about voiding, voiding the bladder. I like, I like, I like that one. I like that. All right. So here we are seeing the urethra, male and female. And with the male, of course, the urethra is longer than in the female. So which one, male? or female, which one would be more susceptible, do you think, to infection? Female. The females, yes. Right, and of course, proximity to anus only heightens it, but you're, they're more susceptible because of the fact, well, at least bladder infections, because of the fact of the short urethra. Here we see the internal sphincter and the external. Which one do we have, which one is voluntary? Which one do we have control over, internal or external? External. external, very good. How would we remember that? Right, if you look, yeah, let me just throw that out to you. How would we remember that we have control over the external as opposed to the internal? Is there a particular way you could think of? Um, sorry, because uh, we could hold hold our um, urination. Yes, 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 yes. Like mm -hmm. Correct is right. So we could hold it. So yes, it's coming on. But you know, the last the last one would be the the last blockage blocking area, the external. It looks kind of like a wall when you think about it. So think about it like that, as your colleague quite rightly said, it blocks it off and prevents us from voiding the bladder. Some persons do have control over that, um, that process, but it's actually a learned process. Yeah, so some persons do suffer with um, bladder incontinence and they do have to use, you know, um, adult disposable diapers and so on. So it's rather interesting in that regard. And you might, of course, you will see it in your professional career. And as persons do get older, sometimes incontinence does arise, particularly in the elderly. All right, we're almost there. Now we're talking about urine. It contains water, electrolytes. So what are the two, what are two of the major electrolytes which you find in urine? And they're, they're components of salt. Sodium chloride. So therefore, which electrolytes would we find? Good, so sodium, thanks, thanks, Loma. So Na plus ions and Cl minus ions, the chloride ions, so both sodium and chloride ions we find in the um, urine. Nitrogenous waste from proteins. And what are proteins? Proteins are made from what? What are the basic components of proteins? AA is a type of acid. Amino acids. Why do they call them amino acids? Because they always vex. So, you know, they mean all the time. So, they call them amino acid. Yeah, you always vex. It's amino acid. Why do they call them amino acid? Because they have what type of group associated with them? Drop the O and add an E from amino. What group they have associated with them?
an amine group. Very good, yeah. So when you look at the structure of an amino acid, all right, let's just go uh, basic structure. On one side, you have a carboxylic acid group, COOH, and on the other side, you have an amine group, NH3, all right? So that NH3, the amine group, and on the other side, you have an acid group. So that's why they call it a amino acid, referring to the two groups which are present on the um, on the structure on the structures in these structures right so amino acids they have both an amine group NH, NH3 and um, an um, uh, acidic group COOH on the ends of the molecule itself so amino acids they're rich in nitrogen and that's how you get the nitrogenous weights. When protein breaks down, you have these nitrogenous weights, namely in the, present, in the forms of urea, uric acid, ammonia, and creatinine. So that's the way, but they all get their nitrogen uh, from protein um, metabolism, or in essence, when you break down the proteins. When you break down the proteins, you're breaking down the amino acids and you're liberating that nitrogen. And what is it good for? Urine, particularly for the so persons, let's say the older folk, if you're talking, if you have older parents or uncles and aunts, if you live in an agricultural region before the advent of, um, you know, these fertilizers, you know, that you buy in the um, agri shops, what they used to do, let's say you have a little fig tree and so on, but you used to see oh, granny, you know. yeah, you see granny get up for the morning. And, but the other thing as well, they would know, sometimes they'd have to leave it for a day or two, the urine. Right, but they would know if you talk to them, talk to your older relatives and so on, they'll give you the whole history of that. And they go and they throw it on the plant. And then some people are bawling, oh, geez, what is that? Yeah, but when you go by granny and she bring the silk pig and they're big like your fist, what are you doing? Um, yum, granny, this is delicious, mm, oh, delicious fig. Mm, mm, right? And but the reason why is because they were getting that nitrogen content to create structural proteins, which are present in the fig that you're eating there. So you have a conversion from the urine, the nitrogenous compounds, and they are actually incorporated into structural proteins present, not only in the plant itself, but also in the fruits that they're taking in. It is not exclusively taken in. I know some people raising their eyebrows and swaying never to eat bananas again, but it's not only exclusively taken in, taken in let's say from, let's say urine or anything like that, but remember nutrients from the soil as well is taken up. So don't, so don't raise your eyes, eyebrows. But um, on the topic of fertilizer though, back in the day before Heber, there was this guy Heber was a German he, and he, were, he actually got the Nobel prize for the Heber process. Anybody ever heard about the Heber process? If you did chemistry, you might've come across it, the Heber process. And what is that Haber process? What is, what is it for? Synthesis of? H-A-B-E-R. Okay, I don't know if somebody could wanna look it up real quick. The Haber process. So using a platinum rhodium catalyst, you could take the air and actually pass it over it. It's, it's very energy cons consuming. By the end of it, what do you get? Anybody looking it up real quick? The Haber process, H-A-B-E-R. And he got a Nobel Prize for his work on it. It was a brilliant process, really. And it is actually still in use today. Anybody got it? Haber process? All right, so what, what is used for is for the production of ammonia, right? So, and you might be saying, well, how, is that a big thing? Oh, yes, it is. Now, this happened during uh, the Second World War. And there was a problem during the Second World War. Germany and Europe, they, they, would, they would get their, their highest source of ammonia. Well, from guess what source they used to get it from? Rather interesting. What do you think they got there? And of course, this ammonia was used for fertilizers in particular. And where they would get it? They would get it from, mm -hmm. some, from people. Um, that would have been useful. It might have raised some eyebrows. And it, for all you know, they actually did use that. But another source, because a little tricky to 
it would have been a little tricky because of the fact of, of the collection process. That's the only thing, but you could use, because just like how granny would throw it on the tree, but the collection process would have been a little tricky. So instead they use something which provides a very plentiful supply of nitrogenous waste and they live in caves and they fly at night. What animal? It's a mammal. Bats? bats, yeah, bats. So the bat ways, we used to call it guano, bat guano. And actually, Chile was a big exporter because of the terrain and lots of caves. Very, it might sound weird, but bat guano was a big industry, huge, huge industry for Chile. So they would export this bat guano, literally, the, <laughs> the, because um, the way how, how bats secrete their waste, you know, they mix the two, both the urine and the fecal matter together. So, you know, and what people would do is go into the caves, literally, and scoop it off the floor. And they would export that by the tons. So bat guano, big thing, and that was used to actually um, acquire ammonia to be used for plants. However, during World War II, with the blockade, you know, and the submarine warfare and all of that, it became exceedingly difficult to actually get the guano from Chile and South America all the way to Europe. So therefore, they threw out this, um, this, 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 this gauntlet to the chemist then. It was like, look, let's see if somebody could come up with an artificial means of making ammonia and enter Haber, right? He was a German scientist and he actually figured it out you know, in terms of how to do it. And for that, it is still in use today. That is one of the most, huh, among the, the most useful processes because they use, you're using nitrogen present in the air. And remember, we do have a lot of nitrogen in the air. Approximately what percentage of our air, the air we breathe is nitrogen? Anybody? About how much? The composition. Right, it's close to um, 80%, right? 70, 75, 80% of the air. So Haber came up with this process using a, this catalyst, a platinum rhodium catalyst, where you could take the air and break it down and actually synthesize ammonia. <laughs> Mind blowing. This was just phenomenal. And you had um, this company coming in and they actually ran with it. They, you know, they hired him as their lead scientist and, um, they, they refined the process and then where they could actually create ammonia. Unfortunately, ammonia is also um, the chief component in explosives. So it had a kind of a bad sidekick to it. But most critically, you know, Haber was credited for the fact, that fact of creating ammonia from the air that we breathe. And he got to you know it's a phenomenon. And to this day, as the main source, you know, in terms of how you create it, yes, you could get it fractionally from natural gas. That is quite true, but it could also be created. The one from natural gas is a lot cheaper to produce, but it could also be created using just the basic air that we breathe as feedstock. Yeah. Okay, so let's continue. So what should not be found in urine? So very importantly, when we're when we on the whole topic of nitrogenous waste, do remember Haber, because without it, we'd have been well, at least Europe would have been in quite a bit of an issue in terms of food supply. Because remember, you need ammonia in terms of a fertilizer. So their fertilizers were under threat because they couldn't get the bat guano from Chile across there. And Heber came up with a life-saving process, indeed. So what these are things that are found in the urine, but what should not be found there? Red blood cell, white blood cells, hemoglobin, bacteria, protein, nitrites, and of course, sugars in the form of glucose. This is just some of the compositions of urine as well, specific gravity, right? It varies from 1.003 to, this is a measure of the water content in it and is measured from by this um, instrument called a urinometer. And depending on the number of solutes, it varies. So again, this is the second to last slide here, the collecting duct goes to the calluses, pelvis, ureters, bladder, and then ultimately to the external environment. And this is shown here, kidneys by the ureter to the bladder and then to the external environment, all right? So that's where we'd stop the lecture for today. I just want to go through ever so briefly 
Um, let's have a look at the one of the exercises here. Let's see if you could reinforce um, our knowledge of the of, of our kidneys. Yes. So this is seven minutes, and let's go. All right, we ready? If if you're all out there, let me just see a, a raise thumb. Just raise your hand. If you're ready to roll, just raise your hand. I see one hand up, two hand up. Good, good. Just raise your hand. Excellent. Five. Only five, five hands up. Okay, good. Let's go. Question one. Kidneys. What's the number one job of the kidneys? Let me see some hands. What's the number one job? Which one do you think? Shanice, go ahead. To get rid of waste. Get rid of waste. Let's, let's see. Correct is right. Well done. Well done. Right? The kidneys have a lot of wood. They remove waste and they also keep the salt levels. So, so your salt, which is sodium chloride and potassium levels in check. They produce hormones. What are the hormones which are produced that make um, red blood cells erythropoietin? That is the hormone that is produced um, by the adrenal gland, erythropoietin, and that stimulates red blood cells from manufacture from the bone marrow. Next one. What is the size of a kidney? I want to see a new hand. Where's the size? Tiola, go ahead. A fist. A fist. All right. Let's have a look. Yes, yes, yes. Most people have two. They're located in the bottom of your rib cage on either side of your span, spine. So are they closer to the dorsal or the ventral region of your body? That's what I ask another question. Your kidneys. Closer to the front or the back? Front being ventral, dorsal to the back. If I were to ask dorsal. that. Dorsal, very good, right? They are retroperitoneally, which means they are more to the back. And when you think of back, you think dorsal. Just like, you know, anytime I think dorsal, I think about, you know, uh, um, dolphin, you know, the dorsal fin, when you see this, they're going through the water or a shark, you see the dorsal fin and that's on the back. Let's go. We have 10 more questions. About how much blood do they filter every day? Ah, let me see some new hands. How much blood do you think? Nothing wrong in getting it incorrect. We all learning together, right? Avril, go ahead. How much blood do you think they filter every day? One gallon. One gallon, okay. We would think it's one gallon, but actually 200 quarts, which is quite a bit, is actually shocking in terms of the volume, right? You would think it's just a small amount. Yeah, because of the fact that this pressure filtration, but during the course of a day, imagine that 200 quarts, OMG, right? Look at that. That is enough blood, imagine, to fill a large bathtub. That's a lot of blood, right? And of course, they turn it into waste and extra water into pee about two quarts, and, and that's what we urinate. So I'm mad at you, because that's a popular thought that everybody had. If this happens, something may be wrong with your kidneys. What do you think that one is? Pain a lot, sir. Huh? Sorry, say it again. Pain a lot. Pain a lot. Let's see if that is so. Yeah, right? People with kidney disease usually don't show. You're right, a change, having to go more or less, right? You may also feel tired, cramps, lose their appetite, and have dry, swollen feet and dry, itchy skin. Okay, very good. If your kidney stop working, what you what you might get? Let me see and some new hands. All right, who hands is that? Renee, go ahead. Either one. Either one. Let's see how that looking. Yeah, you could get either one. So when they can't filter any more waste, your body fills up with these waste. So you actually have to get dialysis. Anybody familiar with dialysis? Having actually worked in a center or have a relative or somebody who has um, diabetes, or you could speak to it. Anybody wants to talk about it in terms of dialysis? Like what's the frequency of dialysis? How long they have to spend in the uh, clinic itself? And how often per week do they have to go? My grandmother used to do dialysis before she passed. Mm -hmm. She used to have to go three times a week. We used to carry her Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Mm -hmm. 
and it's usually used to take about two or two to three hours. Mm, there you go. Thanks very much, Anise. And um, of course, condolences on the passing of your grandmother. But the same yeah, that's time. fine. It was years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I hear you. To that. So again, this the example as shown there. Thanks very much for sharing that, Janice. Three times a week and every time two to three hours for the process. And they filter, they, when you go through dialysis, you're doing the same process as that which your kidneys normally do. Okay, let's go. A common cause of kidney disease is which one? Oh, okay, that's a bias. A common cause of the kidney disease is, let me see some hands, new hands. Mm -hmm. Alina, go ahead. So both. Both. Let's see if you're right. Yeah, correct it right. High blood pressure can hurt small vessels, right? Some blood pressure drugs, especially um, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, can help protect them from disease as well. You can live with one kidney. True or false? Let me see some hands. Okay. Alina, go ahead. True. Yeah, you could live with one kidney, right? And as we mentioned, one of the ways you know that, because some people donate their kidneys as well. Very good. A donated kidney can from can come from where? Let me see some new hands. Alina, go ahead. So both. All right, Alina says both. Let's see if that is so. Correct is right. Um, whereas in Trinidad and Tobago, we don't have such a big organ donation drive. I remembered when um, I was in, you know, going to college in the States and to renew your driver's permit. One of the questions they actually ask you, so let's say the cost of the permit is $40. If you wanted to get a discount like $50, $15 off, you just have to like tick this block. Yes, you know, in the event of passing, I, I would like to be an organ donor. And if you do that, you get a $15 or $20 discount on the renewal of your driver's permit. I think it's a nice, it was a nice incentive in that regard, but over in the States, they're more aggressive in terms of organ transplant, particularly from persons who are recently passed and so on. Yeah, let's go. Someone is added to the kidney transplanting list. Hmm. Well, this is anybody's guess. So in other words, he's a person who need, who need kidneys. All right, so let me see. Um, let me see if any, anybody else other than Alina. Alina, I appreciate everything. Your, your zest. Let's try somebody else. I am mad at you. Rene, I, let me hear somebody new. I didn't hear Averson for the day. Averson, go ahead. So you hear me for the day. Okay, okay, my bad. Rayon, yeah, go ahead. Say, I would say 14 hours. Every 14 hours, okay. That's anybody right. have yeah, anything else? I would say the same thing, thing too. Everybody say 14 hours. I hear some people say 14 seconds. All right, let's check the 14 hours, yeah. And the answer is quick. We would never guess that every 14 seconds. Right, but just goes to show the magnitude of the entire issue, right? This, of course, is based, this is um from the BBC. So this is, well, no, that's untrue. This is from WebMD. So this is based in the US. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm just be refreshing that. That page every 14 seconds. So, see. so the thing is, very good point. But um, let's see, what's the population of the US? Let me just have a look at that real quick. So US population, US population. US population is something like 300 and approximately 330 million. So that would mean, so, and let's say how many persons are actually go to hospital with kidney disease. So even let's say there's 1% of that, we're looking at 3 million, right? So approximately 4 million persons, let's say with kidney disease and new persons being added. Yeah, if you do the maths actually every 14 seconds, I'm not, I'm not really heeding on the math, but it just means that a lot of persons, but remember the population is a really large sample. Yes, Rayon, go ahead. Or you just had up your hand from the thing, no problem. But yeah, but the reason why is because it's such a large population. And yes, kidney issues, it's a really big one. When you're dehydrated, your pee is usually what color? So think about it, when you're dry, when you're dry out. Let me see a new hand. I want to see a new hand. Dark yellow. Dark yellow. Let's have a look, see? 
dark yellow and correct is right, yeah? So, you always, so it's always good to take in your water. Why is it important that we, what does the body use that water for at the level of the cell? Which component of the cell, when you think about a cell, human cell, right? Um, what is, where's the major part, you know, that has the most water in it? It begins with C, Avacyn. Oh, that's from the last question. Okay, anybody wants, which part of the cell has the most water in it? The liquid portion of the cell, what is that known as? Begin with C. Cytoplasm. Cytoplasm. So the, what's the difference between cytoplasm and cytosol? Anybody? Is there a difference or are they the same thing? Yes, there is a difference. So what's the difference? Yes, you're right, cytoplasm, cytosol. So the cytosol is exclusively the liquid portion and the cytoplasm is the liquid portion plus all of the organelles, yeah? So the organelles are, so think about it, you know, like um, jello with fruit cocktail in it. If it does have the jello alone, the cytosol, when you put in the fruit cocktail inside of the jello, right, that is now cytoplasm, make sense? So most of the water is actually in the cytosol or cytoplasm, whichever one you want to call it, the liquid portion. And why do you need all of that water? Two words, MR. And the R stands for reactions. What does the M start? Reactions associated with what? Something that occurs in your body, M. Metabolic. It doesn't Metabolic. make sense. It doesn't make sense. I teach, you all know a very good answer. That was a very, very good and deep answer. Metabolism, right? So all of the metabolic reactions have to take place in a liquid environment. That is why it's critical we take in all of that water. And of course, if you remove it, what happens to the cell, da, 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 it dies, which is why we use salt in terms of salting for preservation. You dehydrate um, when you add the salt, you pull the water out, those reactions cannot occur. So therefore, even for bacteria associated with putrefaction and uh, quote unquote rotting of the cell, those die out. So therefore the cell is preserved. All right, how much? We have two more questions. Let's go. Kidney stones are about the size of a tennis ball. True or false? Let me get some new hands. Kavita, yeah? What do you think? Hello? Yeah, I don't know. Let's have a look. It's not. I thought I was. I think they it's could get pretty big. I was now thinking that it's really, really size, big. Though. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, it might feel that way if you get one, but they can be as tiny as a grain of sand or as big as a pearl. But it's very rare to get them. So it doesn't mean that you don't get them, but it's very rare. That is all. So it went wrong in that, but it's very rare that they get to that size. But it could get rather big. The last one. Taking pain medicines wouldn't affect your kidneys. What do you think? True or false? False. 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 Uh, yeah, as you know, everything has consequences associated with it. All right. So that's it for today's class. Let's stop off there. All right. So let me uh, stop sharing. And I would stop the recording at this point. <laughs>